Ladies and gentlemen, coming soon, a podcast you've all been waiting for. The Movie Podcast to End All Movie Podcasts, a podcast that discusses and critiques the best of the best and the worst of the worst movies playing at a theater near you with a host whose opinions have been deemed as fact by your favorite fact checkers. And that's a fact. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the movie maestro, the tyrant of theater, the gumshoe of review, the man that makes theater employees and Hollywood execs shiver by his mere presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the judge, the jury, the sultan of cinema, Justin Hanson. Welcome to the Movie Wire. Warning. This week on the Movie Wire may contain more than usual foul language, bursts of utter anger, rants of rage, a crescendo of crappiness, and Justin seriously pissed off. For you see, this week has never happened before on the movie wire. This week, Justin faces a week of all bad movies. Don't be afraid, but listening discretion is advised. Now, ladies and gentlemen, your host, Justin Henson. Let's go. Welcome to this week's edition of the Movie Wire. I'm your host, Justin Henson, and welcome to the show. It's been a pretty rough week at the movies, but that also means it's going to be a fantastic, passionate show this week with four brand new reviews, with two new in theaters and two now available to stream. This week on the show, Old Blood meets New Blood and they will die when they're dead in The Expendables 4. Nicolas Cage plays a beach bum, grandfather, and assassin in The Retirement Plan. An exile anxiety-ridden homebody must battle an alien who's found its way into her home in the Hulu original, No One Will Save You. And finally, meet the next generation in the new Netflix reboot in Spy Kids Armageddon. We have a big, interesting show this week, so let's jump right into it. Ready for my verdict? Let's get into it. <laughs> Out of the windows to watch. A roar and a burst of flame. The movie while you're talking about it. There it is. You need people like me. The Wire. And here we go. An exiled, anxiety ridden homebody must battle an alien who's found its way into her home. In the Hulu original, No One Will Save You. No One Will Save You follows a young girl named Bryn who has a darker past. She is sort of deeply hated by the town that she lives in. She is secluded and she keeps to herself. She built this bubble that she feels safe in. A few minutes into the movie, that bubble gets popped. It's absolutely terrifying. Brins an alien in her community. And then this other alien story happens on top of that. And there's so many things I loved about playing this character. She has a major conflict. The emotions that she's going through, they were real to me. Bryn runs a lot in this movie. Brian said, I want you to run like Tom Cruise. And I thought I was a runner before this film. I am now. We throw a couple of curve balls. It's a lot of fun. No one will save you. Now, this isn't true. I will save you. I will save you the time by telling you to turn off this movie after about 30 minutes because that's when the movie sells us on a premise of thrills, chills, and tension. Now, the first 30 minutes of No One Will Save You is actually quite good. It's well shot. The lighting is there. It builds tension and it's suspenseful. And with me, I had the lights down. It was a quiet house and I was getting really uncomfortable by watching what was happening to our main character, Bren, played by Caitlin Dever from Ticket to Paradise, Dear Evan Hansen, and Booksmart. 
part. There was times during the first 30 minutes I was looking over my shoulder and even to the point it reminded me to go lock the door. Writer-director Brian Duffield, who I followed since 2017's The Babysitter, is what I would call a director that focuses on the watching experience by adding elements to focus on the fun factor of watching his films. And even though uncomfortably tense, I was having a great time with the first 30 minutes of No One Will Save You. But as a movie rolled after the initial 30 minutes, it became clear that Duffield got way too ahead of himself, and we can tell he had a vision of one scene, but he had no idea how to execute the rest of the film. Because after the opening scene, there is nothing left in the film to really be memorable or keep the viewer engaged, except the curiosity and hope that we will get the same feeling we got from the first 20-30 minutes. But sadly, we go into the movie that teeters between elevated horror and experimental horror, that has no idea how to balance itself off or decide what it wants to be. Now, No One Will Save You does have a point to say, but it's completely lost in translation because writer-director Brian Duffield ensures that there are no speaking words in the film. He attempts to execute the concept of building tension like we saw in the movie Quiet Place. Now, I can understand what Duffield is trying to do or what his intent is, but the execution is flawed. I can see where he's trying to keep the characters quiet to symbolize a little bit more tension of seclusion, but his overlaying theme and message is too meat and potatoes. It's too heavy-handed to keep our characters silent, and our main character doesn't do enough for Duffield to really land that message. Now, during Brent's time of seclusion, we do see mere glimpse of daily life collecting wooden house buildings to build a miniature town, but during this time of seclusion, we don't really get to know the mystery of Bryn, or even her thoughts, and even when the movie concludes, I don't feel I know anything about her or what she's thinking. So I'm still at this point unsure if Duffield's decision to keep this movie quiet was a smart move, because between the seclusion of being alone with Bryn and our alien encounters, Duffield's messaging doesn't really translate well to what he's trying to say, and by the end of the film, it's still becomes a head-scratcher, not merely because there is so much to cover, but so little. It feels like Duffield's message is bigger than what the movie's trying to portray. With being a mute film, Duffield is relying on Caitlin Dever's body language and her actions, with the aliens playing more of a supporting role. But with the body language, we can vaguely kind of fill in the blanks of the messaging, but when we get the aliens thrown in, it's like we're watching two completely different movies. Especially during the last act of the film, Duffield loses his sense of style of what he built in the beginning. It's like the beginning was meant to be the middle of the movie, and I needed more of a buildup of our brain character, but but even though the beginning is creepy, as I reflect, I'm sure this would have been an even better scene if we had some more build-up to our Bryn character, including shot scenes and more examples of the seclusion factor. I truly think Duffield got ahead of himself and rushed to the attempt to really suck the viewer in with his fantastic, based vision of an idea, but after this scene ends, he had no idea what kind of movie he wanted to make. We consistently get different tones and feels, and this just leads to the movie just feeling all over the place, and we are consistently chasing to find out where this movie wants to land and what it wants to be. Now, Caitlin Dever is a lovely actress, but one thing for sure is that this wasn't the movie for her. She is way out of her element when it comes to relying on just her facial expression and body language. Even during the first 30 minutes, there were questionable things of her performance that I just didn't buy into. But Duffield's direction during this time was spot on to compensate for these downfalls. But Dever trying to carry the entire movie, I really wasn't bought into her performance. And this is where one of the problems lands. When the film relies completely on her with no other element, this is where it just becomes generic, where we have no stakes and no credibility in the storytelling. We are not bought into the character, and we are slowly losing faith in how the story is being told, and how it's being delivered to us. The film does hint at a mysterious backstory that I personally lost interest in halfway through, because there was really nothing in the build-up to really make me want to care. It had my interest at first, but once I realized the story wasn't going anywhere, and there wasn't really the same tone that we got from the first 20-30 minutes, I just stopped having interest and I started losing faith in our character and our story. Storytelling. Even to the point, even if we got a really solid summed up climax, I still wouldn't have thought that this would have been worth it. And once you get to that point, this is what really makes the film just drag along until the climax that had a perfect opportunity to build that same tension that we got from the beginning scene, but treats it like a completely different movie that is completely frustrating. The film tries to show it has multiple layers, and it really tries its hardest to have some themes of guilt and redemption, but the way it attempts to execute the final product just doesn't work.
No One Will Save You has some great technical aspects and a memorable opening, but lacks in getting the story to point A to point B with the same amount of finesse and tone we saw from the beginning. Duffield had a slight vision of messaging and a concept, but no idea how to execute it. The result is a hybrid of an experimental and elevated horror that never reaches either. But the first 30 minutes is worth a watch, so just kind of treat this as a short film. I'm giving No One Will Save You one and a half stars. When Ashley and her young daughter Sarah get caught up in a criminal enterprise that puts their lives at risk, she turns to a strange father, Matt, currently living the life of a retired beach bum in the Cayman Islands and the retirement plan. I haven't seen my daughter, and now her daughter shows up at my front doorstep and not a word. I think my parents are in some kind of trouble. Oh, Ashley's in trouble. What is it this time? Get on that flight and do not come back without my hard drive. Purpose for your visit? Pleasure. Lay low for a few minutes. Welcome to the island. I'm losing my patience. Oh, no, no. Ah. Boom. Kills him. I just got out of here with my life. Did you shoot me? Yeah, I guarantee you there's more men that are already coming. And they will not stop until we are all dead. Come on, Ashley. Come on. Ashley. Who are you? The old guy. He keeps killing everybody. Everybody. Who is this guy? My dad's an assassin, isn't he? Yeah, your dad's totally an assassin. Grandpa! Here, have some more serves, sweetheart. Now, Nicolas Cage has been on a lucky streak with his last bit of films, if you take out his more recent sympathy for the devil. And I am personally glad to have him back in projects that are not just generic straight-to-streaming low-grade films to use a famous name to gain viewers to mask a poorly made film that we see a lot from talent in current times. And to be perfectly honest, I was looking forward to seeing yet another Nick Cage film in a theater after Renfield, especially with a cast that includes Ron Perlman, Ernie Hudson, and even Joel David Moore. But I can't say that I didn't have my reservations or I wasn't concerned just due to the fact the writer-director of the retirement plan is director Tim Brown, who's responsible for a lot of those generic straight-to-VOD or streaming films that I spoke of. With such cinematic classics as Vampire Dog, Treasure Hound, Step Dogs, and who can forget the utter classic of Bark Ranger. Tim Brown must really like dog movies. Jesus Christ. The moment we see Nick Cage on screen and open his mouth and deliver his first set of lines, my eyes got big as the words, oh fuck, came out of my mouth and I discovered I was tricked. The studio snuck in one of those generic films onto the screen and hoped for it to pass as a legitimate, well-cast action film. I could tell right from the first set of lines delivered by Cage what I was in store for. It was like I can tell the future of what the problem of this film was going to be. It was going to be horrible acting, horrible directing, solely based on this 30-minute span. And when it comes to our fantastic cast, it's either going to end with horrible character direction or just a complete miscast. But I kept an open mind. I kept my hopes still high that this film was going to recover and get better thinking there is no way this film is going to keep up this utterly awful writing. But again, I was wrong. The film starts below the line, and then it just ends up sinking like the Titanic. After an hour goes by, my elbow is on the armrest, hands in my face, covering my eyes from an utter mess of a movie this is. It actually accomplishes the task of getting even worse. And before I say in every aspect, I do want to say that the performances do get a sliver better. Just a sliver better. And that's not saying much. The written dialogue is so awful, even though the performances are better. It's not necessarily that. It's our talented cast doing the best they can with the complete flaming garbage of a screenplay that seems like it came from a rejected episode of the TV show Chuck. Tim Brown's screenplay is so bad, and I think he actually acknowledges this during the middle of the movie, because it seems like he instructs the cast on purpose to overact the body language, and it becomes laughable. It's almost like we see the cast wink at each other before they do something sneaky or give false information. 
It's like a child trying to keep a secret, but he really can't. The body language is so overacted, and it's like Tim Brown is trying to use this as a distraction to make sure nobody's paying attention to the actual spoken words. Even Brown doesn't have the confidence in his crappy screenplay to ensure these cast members have anything to work with. Now, the retirement plan's core conflict is that our character Ashley, played by Ashley Green, gets into trouble by stealing a thumb drive and has to get her daughter to safety, and she entrusts her father, Matt, played by Nicolas Cage, who has a mysterious background that the film doesn't really make that mysterious. And as a topper, Ashley hasn't spoken to her father in years, and now Matt lives a low-key life in the Cayman Islands, until Ashley's daughter Sarah, played by Thelia Campbell, randomly shows up on the Cayman Islands to stay with her grandfather, Matt. Now, there is some core potential elements here to work with, which could go to the extremely fun, cheesy comedy route, or it could go to the absolute serious route. And Tim Brown has no idea what type of movie he wants to do here. He has no experience in writing an adult comedy, and he doesn't really have the technical talents to really make a serious tone film. Given that the tone and the camera shots throughout the movie doesn't really add anything to the story, there's no way Tim Brown would have actually made this a serious film. And what is left for the viewer is just a film that just drags us along like we're in limbo waiting for this movie to be over. The only thing I did enjoy in the retirement plan is the relationship between Ron Perlman's criminal character, Bobo. Yes, we have a character named Bobo. And our young character, Sarah, who between the two of them have a really likable chemistry and some innocent banter. But this is never really fully utilized or even realized by Brown of the chemistry that he has in his lap. And the ending result to this relationship is unfulfilling and it holds true to the over lingering theme of disappointment from the entire movie. But the final straw in the sloppiness that is the retirement plan is the absolute atrocious editing that is done by Robert Brakey from a lot of generic fluff films, but also Furry Vengeance and 1998's Jack Frost. And we also do have editor Kurt Nishomera from American Underdog in 2022's Dealing With Dad. This awful editing is especially prominent in the final 30 minutes. Brakey and Nishomera have nothing on their resume to really be experienced in a lot of what Brown's vision of action is. And nor does he know how to direct what his vision is based on what we got as an outcome. To the point I felt embarrassed for the cast. You know how sometimes things are so embarrassing and cringy you just feel bad and you start to curl your toes. That was my feeling during the last 30 minutes of the retirement plan. The retirement plan, I hope, isn't a setback for the progression of Nick Cage's film run. The screenplay is absolutely embarrassing, as well as the editing. The acting is a hit or miss. But overall, you can tell that the cast have no idea how to handle a script so bad. The story had potential, along with the chemistry of the characters. But that is wasted without realization of what Brown has written. I'm pretty sure Brown wrote this film half asleep and directed this film from a Zoom meeting. It is one of the sloppiest movies this year. Don't be tricked into seeing this in theaters. I'm sure you will see this hit streaming here soon. Because I'm 100% sure that this is what it was intended for. God, this movie was awful. I'm giving the retirement plan one star. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, make sure you check out my reviews on previous episodes for movies that are available to rent, buy, or stream now. Now available, he's a superhero whether he likes it or not in Blue Beetle, which was stylish, but the rest of the cast looked like they were having more fun than our hero. Blue Beetle bugged me enough to only receive two and a half stars. Our big fat Greek family is back, this time on a trip to Greece, which had no point to its existence and tried to make me smile so much to the point it was pissing me off. My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 received one and a half stars. Based on a true story from Gamer to Racer and Gran Turismo, which kept hitting the brakes receiving two stars. Don't Rush, Die Slow, and Slother House, which moved pretty fast to put a smile on my face with three stars. And finally, She's Everything and He's Just Ken, and one of the biggest surprises and hits of the year is Barbie, which was more than just Hollywood plastic receiving three and a half stars. Make sure you catch up on those reviews, and while you do, don't forget to hit follow or subscribe, and please don't forget to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Now, before we get into the last set of reviews, there is a podcast that has become my weekly lunchtime tradition. It gives me a chance to take a short break from the workplace and listen to a fantastic pod and have some great laughs. And that's with J&K over the Fuck My Work Life podcast. So let's hear from the amazing J&K now. Work sucks. Am I right, Jay? Yeah, Kay, it does. 
But luckily, the Fuck My Work Life podcast is here to help you through. In this comedy podcast, we share memorable workplace stories through guests and listener submissions in the hopes of brightening your day, or at least leave you thinking, maybe you don't have it so bad after all. Listen to Fuck My Work Life on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on all the socials at FMWL Pod. Armed with every weapon they can get their hands on, the Expendables are the world's last line of defense and the team that gets called when all other options are off the table in the Expendables 4. Welcome home, honey. Do you read now? What is this? It's classified. Come with you. Oh, I'm sorry. You weren't invited. Oh. <gasps> Hey, why are you here? I got this situation where I need your help. I need bad friends. Was that the new guy? Is that sniper? Don't worry about it. I got a prescription scope. Oh, guys, remember this face. Don't shoot it by accident. <laughs> Terrorists have taken possession of nuclear missiles on a cargo ship off the coast. If these babies go off, it'll be World War III. Take cover! To choose this life over friends, God! over family. It's time to get loud. Let's fly, baby! That's what I'm talking about. Is that the biggest one you've got? Oh, it's way bigger than that. Now, going in to watch a movie like The Expendables, you know what you're getting into when you buy a ticket. A lot of nostalgic action stars fighting, shooting, and blowing a lot of stuff up. But let's be honest here. The biggest attraction to one of these movies is the inclusion of all these nostalgic action stars all together in one movie and watching these action stars team up and interact with each other. And when it comes to the first three Expendable films, even though I wasn't a huge fan, but I was a fan of watching the cast interact with each other, and that at least added some good entertainment value. The Expendable films in no way are thought-provoking films, but it knows exactly the audience it's aiming for. But now when it comes to The Expendables 4, which completely forgets its audience and begs the question when the credits roll, why in the hell was this movie even made? Expendables 4 plays out like a low-par video game where it takes no time whatsoever to jump right into the action and somewhere in the action they throw in an attempt at a plot. And I wouldn't necessarily even call it a story because there are not enough elements here to define this movie as a complete story. We have characters thrown in including returning Jason Statham, Sylvester Stallone, Randy Couture, and Dolph Lundgren. And then we throw in some new members of the Expendables that I could care less about like 50 Cent, Jacob Sapio, Levi Tran, and Megan Fox whose main role, I'm convinced, is just to be purely just an intentional prop from the filmmakers to just be present to have sex and no matter what the environment is, to show off her body in a crop top with perfect makeup at all times. You try and put these new characters next to the ones that we are used to, such as Jet Li, Antonio Banderas, Bruce Willis, Harrison Ford, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Wesley Snipes, Jackie Chan, and Mel Gibson. Expendables 4 looks and feels like table scraps left on a table. And if our filmmakers wanted to cut a memorable cast down to what we got, I would hope that the action would really compensate for the loss of the cast we have grown accustomed to. But the action is lazy, forgettable, and at times just plain stupid. When we talk about a lack of returning talent, we also see this with the writing. The previous three Expendable films had Stallone as a piece of the writing credits. This go-around, we have writers Kurt Wimmer, who most recently wrote some generic pieces of shit, such as The Misfits and more current Children of the Corn, and reboots of Point Break and Total Recall. We also have writers Tad Daygard and Max Adams with limited writing credits. 
Expendables 4 is definitely missing some of that magic Stallone touch from his screenplay treatment. And it shows in this movie greatly because the screenplay is non-existent. And as we look at Sylvester Stallone, we take the Stallone name and tie him into acting in some of the most memorable films. But what many forget is that most of his memorable films Stallone has acted in, he has actually helped write the screenplay, such as Rocky, Rambo, Cliffhanger, Creed, and of course, the first three Expendable films. Stallone is just not a muscle on screen, but he is truly very creative and a good writer that knows how to please an audience. And in comparison, Expendables 4 plays like somebody pulled the rug out from the audience where we miss any sort of fun element from it. The script feels like the finished product was merely only about five pages long, with most of the dialogue we hear our three writers probably just stole from listening to a Call of Duty game for a couple hours. As a matter of fact, I think I've heard better dialogue coming from 12-year-olds during a game of Call of Duty than what was presented in this movie. There is nothing of value for the audience to really attach themselves to and really care about. We take these new characters that are not as shiny on screen as we've gotten in the past, and even with these new characters, they're just kind of placed in the middle of action like they're just used as props, to be seen and not heard. There's no edge of your seat action, and when we do get action, which is 98% of the movie, it is poorly choreographed lazy and it's just the same fighting over and over again. A lot of the generic feel we get is from the new director at the helm, Scott Waugh, whose biggest credits is 2014's Need for Speed and 2012's Acts of Valor. The directing here is so cut and dry simplistic, there's no creativity, and it lacks any attention to detail. The action scenes just seem lazy and cartoonish. Between the cuts of our high-profile talent on screen, along with the watered-down off-screen filmmaker talent, this is the result. A completely generic, forgettable action movie that I wouldn't even define as action, but rather just like a theme park spectacle. The most frustrating piece of Expendables 4 is that with all these cutout elements, as a viewer, I felt like I was cheated, and the film went for a complete cash grab vibe of the Expendables name for something that should have went straight to streaming. And even then, if it went straight to streaming, it wouldn't be more than just a generic piece of trash with a couple of recognizable names to put on a poster. There is no element whatsoever to justify a watch of Expendables 4, with the exception of Stallone and Statham's chemistry, which we don't get enough of in the film. But the two do like they're having fun with their back and forth banter. But these two are the only ones that seem to be having any fun in the movie. The rest of the cast just seems to be hanging out like waiting to be picked for a team of a game of basketball. Expendables 4 is going to be one of those movies in the franchise that people are going to say, yeah, Expendables 4, let's just forget that movie ever happened. Actually, I'm giving this movie way too much credit. Nobody is going to remember this movie over time. Expendables 4 is completely expendable. I'm giving Expendables 4 one star. It's so hard to keep track and even have time to read all the trending topics on the web. Now there's a new app to help with all of those problems. Newsly is an audio app for iOS and Android. It picks up web articles about the most trending topics on the web at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time in the history of the internet, the entire web becomes listenable. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. You can follow any topic as specific as you like from sports, science to Bitcoin. You can even follow Kardashian. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you out loud. And guess what? They have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 50 countries. The Movie Wire is now a featured podcast on the Newsly app. Download and use Newsly for free now. The link will be in the description of this episode. You can also use one of my promo codes that you will find in the description as well to get you a one month free premium subscription. Stop scrolling, start listening, download Newsly today. The children of the world's greatest secret agents unwittingly help a powerful game developer unleash a computer virus that gives them control of all technology, leading them to become spies themselves to save their parents and the world in the new Netflix reboot of Spy Kids Armageddon. Games? Do you want to get busted? There's something wrong with this game. Antonio. Hi. Oh, good. It's locked. Just making sure. Really? Something is happening. It's all over the world. It's like somebody combined a virus with... The Armageddon Code. What are these things? They're bad guys from our video game. Get out of here, kids. Go! Wait a second. I think Mom and Dad are spies. You think? We have to find Mom and Dad now. 
Hey, kiddos. If you're here now by yourselves, that means something has gone wrong. We couldn't wait to show you the safe house. There's food and spy training modules. How to be a spy. I'm going to be the best spy ever. You did it. Oh. Almost good. It's a spy suit generator. Since we caused this whole game apocalypse, we have to stop the bad guys and save the world. Let's do it. Activate magnets. <laughs> the clock's ticking. We can do this. Hold on a second. We go into the video game? No, 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 no. Mm -mm. I think we need to regroup. There's no time. Who's gonna save? We are dealing with a highly intelligent enemy. Shall we? Wait! Why are there so many of them? It's more fun that way. For the love of God, can I just get one fucking good movie this week? I mean, I just watched a movie that was about a killer sloth in a sorority house that I gave a good review to. And that movie was better than all four of these movies combined. Let that sink in for a second. A damn killer, slow-moving animal that kills people in a fucking sorority house and I can't find one goddamn movie this week. But okay, let's just get into this piece of shit. All right, here is the new Spy Kids movie, Spy Kids Armageddon. And I have to say, I don't get it. I really don't get it. This is a new cinematic strategy of stupidity. Netflix's new reboot of Spy Kids takes the same simplistic concept of spy parents getting kidnapped by a cartoonish villain. Kids are left to discover parents' secret life of spies, and then they become spies themselves. And I get that piece of it. I understand that piece of it. I'm okay with the simplistic concept of that. And if they want to utilize that in the new reboot, that's fine and dandy. And I get with this formula, this is the easiest way to reboot a simplistic story like this is to take the basic fundamentals of the concept into its reboot. Now, I have said it on this show numerous times before. I am not against any reboots. There is a curious part of me that wants to explore the curiosity of another vision of a story, almost like taking an adaption from a book. And yes, as I've said numerous times before, these reboots do fail more than they succeed. And furthermore, it will never change my opinion of how I feel about the originals. And this is where I'm utterly confused when it comes to calling Spy Kids Armageddon a reboot because we take the exact same writer, the same exact director, Robert Rodriguez from the original Spy Kids movies that started back in 2001 to write and direct this reboot. And I simply just don't get it. What would drive Robert Rodriguez to revisit this franchise to say he could have done it better and then he made it worse? This is where I do have a problem because he has already done it. And I was a fan of the first two Spy Kids. I thought they were playful family fun with some fantastic direction and visuals that felt like fresh family entertainment with a sense of style. But as I was writing my review of Spy Kids Armageddon, I felt my head shake back and forth in pure disappointment to the point I needed a neck pillow to hold my head in place. Not only just watching the film, but actually thinking about Robert Rodriguez and what has happened to him. What has happened to that director in the late 90s to early 2000s that I found to be an interesting director that stood out in style and vision? This is a man that directed other than the original Spy Kids films, directed and wrote such movies as Desperado, Four Rooms, Planet Terror, Machete, and my personal favorite, Sin City. Rodriguez has been on a decrescendo with his films, and I feel that Spy Kids Armageddon not only will be his worst movie to date, but also a stop sign to reevaluate his projects. Now, even though I questioned a reboot with the same creator and director from the original, I was still curious to view a film that Rodriguez felt the need to himself create a reboot of his original concept. I was thinking there must be something he wanted to improve upon, so I kept an open mind. But by keeping this open mind, there was a danger in watching Spy Kids Armageddon because I felt I was literally getting dumber by the minute. This reboot isn't improved upon, but it feels like it's in the same universe as the 2006 comedy Idiocracy, and it has characters and props like an episode of Blue's Clues. This film could definitely live in the same universe of the movie Idiocracy because everything the characters do is completely stupid. And before you think it or say it, I know I get it. It's a kids movie. It's meant to be simplistic, silly, easy to understand. 
but I wouldn't subject this movie to any of my kids. This film would even make a toddler stand up, tilt his head, look to the screen, and say, damn, these people are stupid. Now we bring in some new spy parents played by Shazam, Zachary Levi, and Annihilation's Gina Rodriguez, who replaced the original parents in Antonio Banderas and Carlo Gogino's original roles. We also have a new set of spy kids. We have Tony, played by Connor Esterson, and Patty, played by Everly Carganilla, who both have to stop a madman called The King, played by Billy Maganusen, who is responsible for the most popular video game in the world, and wants to control the world by the means of this game. Now, the strongest point of this movie is the visuals, even though we can feel it's a low budget knockoff of the original because the original's visuals were way better and they had some imagination to them but i will give a small amount of credit for some brief moments a spark of cool moments but all these cool moments lose credibility by stupid gadgets dumbed down situations including a way too long gag on overly large fly traps smacking our kids in the face during spy training that looks like a playground at an elementary school and these gags and situations result in nothing in the progression of the story, nor do they really utilize this training in the film. Spy Kids Armageddon was written again by Rodriguez, but also in his first writing credit by son Racer Max. And in regards to Racer Rodriguez, I have to say somebody has to start somewhere. And it's a shame it was this film. When it comes to his first writing credit, the screenplay is just all over the place, to the point it's complicated. Not because it's intended to be, but rather the script contradicts itself consistently. Characters just say random things and our characters are just written beyond dumb. It's such an elementary screenplay that it reminded me of a child trying to spell big words with crayon on paper. After watching Spy Kids Armageddon when I saw Rodriguez's son had a writing credit, my first thought was, that makes more sense. A child did have his touch into writing this screenplay. That would explain a lot of the potholes and a lot of the confusing dialogue. But then I go on to read that his son is a 26-year-old man, and now I'm even more confused. Now, what made the first Spy Kids stand out amongst the other family films of its era is that it did have a little something for everyone to enjoy, and it also had imagination and childlike heart to it. It felt like a caliber of both kids and adults that worked on the previous Spy Kids films. And then we get Armageddon that has no childlike heart, it has no heart whatsoever, and very little imagination. And it adds nothing we haven't seen before except being extremely watered down and dumbed down. At one point, I was daydreaming trying to entertain myself while watching this movie, and I had a visual of Rodriguez at his desk trying to write this screenplay. But as we look closer and I zoom in on what he's actually writing, it's just him trying to color inside the lines of a picture with no success. It almost feels like every aspect was written as a copy, but with the only change is that everything and everyone got extremely stupid, dumb, and lazy. The plot makes no sense, the motivation of the villain is ludicrous, and every single character is completely idiotic. This is one of the most frustrating movies of the year. I felt I just wanted to put the filmmakers in time out for two hours. Here in the movie, the concept of the world's most popular video game is conquering the world's technology. But for a popular video game, nobody seems to know how to play it. The motivation of the villain and the plot is so poorly explained that I felt I was getting dumber as each and every minute goes by. Spy Kids Armageddon made me wish for an actual Armageddon while watching this movie so it could just be over. This, hands down, is the worst movie of the year. To the point I had to take four mental breaks to regroup and decide if I really one to finish this movie and this movie will also be responsible for one of my greatest life regrets of not taking my gut instinct hitting the power button and just simply walking away from this film and i know this is a kids movie and i try to keep it pg but i have to say this movie is absolutely fucking horrible i'm giving spy kids armageddon no stars And that's a cut on this week's edition of the Movie Wire. Thank God. I want to thank you for listening and thank you for your support. You can also show support by following me on Instagram, Blue Sky, X, Thread, Facebook, and Letterbox at Movie Wire Show. Until next week, do me a favor. Make sure you stay for after the credits to show the respect to those that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a feature film and support your local movie theaters. A verdict has been made on this episode of The Movie Wire by your host, Justin Hansen. He thanks you for listening to the show. You can follow Justin on Instagram and Twitter at Movie Wire Show or visit his website, www.themoviewire.com. Oh, and don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we will see you. 
at the movies. Thank you for bringing me to the movies.